Hello, everyone. Welcome to the new Now Agora. I'm very pleased to have Julian Rose with us here today. He's going to share with us a bit about his participation in our upcoming new Now Agora meeting place and marketplace. Julian Rose is an organic farmer, first and foremost. He's been an author. He travels the world. He's a sovereign educator. He likes to look outside the box and share with people how they can live happy, healthy, and free lives. Julian, thank you so much for joining us here today. Well, it's a pleasure to join you, and um, it's been a long time coming. It has, it has. So perhaps, you know, in a bit of a brief introduction, you can share with our viewers what you do, what you'd like to do, and what you may be sharing in relation to the information that they'll get a chance to share with you as we go live over the next little while. Right. Well, um, it's a long story, my life. It's been very diverse, very diverse indeed. And when I look back on it, I think it's extraordinary how one part managed to join up with another part eventually and show that these various bits of my life came together and show that it can be whole. It's not a, actually a section of different segments. It's actually a whole thing. And I think people will be interested to know that um, I was born into a, an aristocratic family on an English country estate. And, and that's a, not an easy thing. I was the fourth child. I was the youngest child. I, there was no chance that I, it would come to me. Except, unfortunately, um, I lost my elder brother in a motor racing accident when I was um, 16, 15 years old. And my father, rather surprisingly, died of a stroke two years later. And since uh, land passes down the male line in England, it all came to me when I was uh, 19 years old. Mm. And I was interested really in the arts. I wanted to be involved in acting and uh, directing uh, theatre and stuff like that. I'd been very involved in drama at school and I liked it. Drama and sport. I didn't like academics. I, I was, I failed at most of my academic stuff, which saved me going to some very nasty English private schools, which would have tried to knock everything out of me. They ordered the first school, my prep school. They call it prep school. That's age seven to 12. They tried desperately to knock all the, the subtlety out of you, uh, all the more delicate elements in your body to make you into a leader in the Commonwealth. Mm. But I did hang on. I, I put it in my pocket and I said, I'm going to try and survive this ordeal. I'll become streetwise at least from surviving it. And that's going to be an education in its own right. So I, I managed to get through. Uh, but anyway, after leaving school, I, I headed out to Australia because I wanted to get out of England fundamentally. And I went on, I remember I went on a ship and it cost 60 quid. To get it took five weeks. It was um, it was called Chandra's Lines. It was a Greek ship, wow. and uh, it took five weeks to get to Melbourne. And when it finally arrived, there was a huge gale, and we couldn't land. We had to go to Perth. Uh, sorry, no, to uh, Sydney uh, because they couldn't dock. And so, and I had my first experience flying in an airplane from Sydney back to Melbourne again, which is where I had a, a cousin who offered to put me up. While I was working there, I worked in the Australian Broadcasting Commission for a little bit as a grams operator. I worked in advertising, but more interestingly, I spent four or five months working in the outback of Australia, which is, the outback is like a sort of desert. It's in Queensland, North Australia. Uh, in the summertime, it's thick with grass and uh, well, I think more like in the winter time, I guess. And in the other seasons, it's completely barren. So it goes between these two extremes, very, very verdant and very, very barren. And I was there in the barren season and we spent most of the time moving cattle on horseback between water holes. Vast uh, crowds, of, I think 35,000 cattle and in various blocks. And the place was the size of Wales. You know, that was, I remember them telling me this is about the size of, it's about the size of Wales, Mike, you know. That's a small place up there in the Queensland, yeah. So I had a very interesting experience, particularly working with the Aboriginals who were hired on this farm, who were very, very remarkable people. And I take a great deal of pleasure in remembering my experiences working with them, how they took me onto the land and showed me so many things I had no idea about. How you can survive off grubs and little roots from plants and how the wild turkey 
runs in a particular way. And if you want to catch it, what you try and do to catch it and how you cut the hide off a, a, an animal and make it into something on a gate to stop the other animals when they kick, hurting themselves. They learned a huge amount from these people. Uh, very interesting things happened, however. The boss, who was a white Australian, uh, didn't treat them very well. Uh, and they were proud people. And he used to tell them, be here at seven o'clock in the morning to do such and such a job. And I'll, I'll be telling you what to do. And he came at eight and they hung around waiting and they hung around waiting. He came at eight and they complained to him and he told them to shut up. Yeah? Well, that went on for a while. And one day I was there when this happened. They said to him, boss, you don't come when we come. You won't see us anymore. Yeah? So he said, I shall am, get on with the job. So the next day, they disappeared, the whole lot. They went back into the bush and he was left going. And this was an amazing experience. <laughs> so that is very uh, important to my life because what had touched me was a connection with the land, which I hadn't had. I'd had a connection with the land in a very simple sort of way in England uh, via watching what went on on the, on the farm. But this was very real and deeper. And when I got back to England, I decided that this was going to be in some way, not such an ordeal as I'd thought before taking on this country estate. But I had no clue how. And my interest was still broadly the arts. And I went to, I managed to get a job with the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, uh, take a course that is uh, in stage management and some acting. And I left there and I became involved in traditional uh, touring theatre companies in England for about a year. But out of that, interestingly enough, came an invitation by a colleague in America to come out there. And then I spent about a year, no, sorry, six, seven months traveling in the States. Uh, I had a Greyhound bus ticket, which was 100 days for $100. And anyway, anyone will remember such a thing. 100 days for 100. I got all the way over from the East Coast, the West Coast, to Florida, to up north, Wisconsin, and over the, over the mountains, Colorado, and landed up in Los Angeles when it finally died, this ticket. It was finally finished. <laughs> and then I got myself to San Francisco, which I had a wonderful time there. And I had my first real experience of a, a spiritual journey via experience in a commune in San Francisco. It was the end of the hippie era. This is about 1970. You know, there were still flower power people wandering around with uh, flowers in their hair. And everyone was uh, going to myself, hey, man, hey, hey. And I liked it. <laughs> you can imagine for someone born into an aristocratic family in England, that would be a very liberating experience. And when I got back from America, um, I was rung by the people that ran the experimental theater company and I joined them. They invited me back again to Boston as an actor. And I, I spent 10 years working together with this Thales Theater of New England, it was called at the time. We moved to Europe, we set up a, a school and an institute called the Institute for Creative Development in Antwerp in Belgium. And I worked there as a teacher, yoga teacher, uh, because I had experience in Boston very important uh, uh, time when I lived and worked in the Shivananda Yoga Center in Boston and learned Hatha Yoga. And that had helped me enormously to understand the deeper side of myself. And I started uh, operating as a teacher of that, as well as doing drama. So it's, it's drama. We moved around in various places in Europe as a touring theater company, putting on plays which were performed with about six or seven actors, no props, no set, actors playing all the different roles in stories like playing wind, playing trees, playing storms, playing actual physical characters, playing cocks and cows and horses. And it was wonderful and I loved it. Very, very physical, very, very creative, very demanding. But trying to get to the point where the country estate comes back into the picture. I knew I must go back and take this on. My mother had been looking after it very ably, I have to say, in the meantime. And I was very fortunate in that a lecturer came to Antwerp um, to talk about something called The Laws of the Land, a film made by the BBC at the time. And it was all about something called organic farming. Mm. 
but I managed to get to this lecture. I heard it. I had an apotheosis. I said, this is what I've got to do. I went straight over to England and I said to my mother, we're going to be organic farming mother. And she said, oh, I'm so glad, darling. I hate those chemicals. And I thought, well, we're on the same track with mother, which is very good news because that's going to make life a lot easier. And I started developing in 1975 my organic farm and I was registered as an organic official and organic farmer under the Soil Association, the leading organic, organic charity in England, as the number four organic farmer in England. So I'm one of the pioneers of that particular uh, type of work. And it put me back in touch with nature at a very real level. It's a struggle, believe me, farming is not easy. Uh, it's the land we have is very hilly, very stony soils, very difficult to farm, very beautiful. Uh, half the farm is, half the estate is farmland, half the estate is forestry. And then there's houses and there's all sorts of other things to take care of. But I've made the farming my number one aim to be, get it going, get it going well. And as an organic farm, no chemicals, no pesticides, no herbicides, real food coming straight off the land. I sold everything direct to the public. And my main product was unpasteurized milk. And I was forced to fight a campaign because the government tried to ban it while I was producing it. And I started an organization called the Unpasteurized Milk Association. And uh, we got 150 other small dairy farmers involved and we beat the government in three months. They, they gave up. So that was a good story. I'll tell you that story at length, more length at another time. And then they tried again 10 years later and no, they still failed. <laughs> This made me quite well known in England because I was regularly featuring on television and radio, telling my story, usually holding up a bottle of raw milk for the cameras, you know. I, I became a swear word with the, with the producers, the, the grand, vast, cop, the, the, the corporation producers of pasteurized milk. They said my word, Julian Rose became a swear word about it amongst those people. They, they did not, they wanted to see the back of me, you know. <laughs> So anyway, that's pretty much uh, bringing me up to date, apart from the last 20 years of my life, when I uh, went through a divorce, when around the year 2000, and I met at the same time a very remarkable Polish lady called Jadwiga Wapata, who asked me if I would like to uh, use my experience to help her form the International Coalition to Protect the Polish Countryside and to come to Poland and to launch campaign to try and save the small farms of Poland from being destroyed by the corporate globalist world of food and farming. And I agreed, and I'm here now. That's where I am talking from, Poland. <laughs> I'm still here after almost 20 years. I go regularly back to England and spend time on my farm, I go to and fro, but I haven't been able to this year because of COVID. So I've been here for a really long time this year, eight months without going back to my farm in England. It's no problem because I'm very fortunate in that my son and my daughter uh, have taken the, the state on and moving forward. Um, my farm that I started is being looked after very well by another organic farmer who I rent to. The forestry is being very well looked after by my daughter's husband, who's a forester and very green one. So I can rest easy that it's the, um, the, the estate and the experiment, which it really is, is moving forward. And one of the really fascinating things about it is that it's heading under their ownership, particularly, not ownership yet, I still own it, but under their auspices towards being a cooperative, which is something we were always interested in, that um, the people on the living there would become part of the running of it, as opposed to just tenants. You know, there's a big difference, obviously. Mm. And it's a, it's, this is not an easy thing, because people who are onlookers don't know what it means to have real responsibility. So if you give someone real responsibility, you have to have a huge trust in them because if they botch it, you've got major problems, you know? So I'm really tentative about this thing, but on the other hand, I know it's the right direction to go. And I know we must share our resources and not own our resources. You know, we must share them. We can own a small part of them, of course, but maybe broadly speaking, we must share them. So that's the direction which um, it's Hardwick, it's called, Hardwick Estate is moving. In. And I'm very excited about this. We'll, we'll go on being an ever more innovative 
I think, small scale organic farms, probably small holdings with many more people working the land will be very much at the forefront of everything. And meanwhile, in Poland, uh, well, the very first thing that I got involved in was a campaign to try and prevent genetically modified organisms getting into this country, because that was the plan. Uh, and we knew about it. And when Poland joined the European Union in 2004, in 2004, yes, uh, it opened the doors to the big corporations. And it, the whole idea became then to amalgamate lots of small farms into very big farms and make them more efficient, in quotes, and make them much more involved in the intense chemical farming, mm. which has destroyed so much biodiversity on this planet already and the food chain, of course. And we were very determined not to let that happen. So Jan Viga and I worked together in very intensely for the first two or three years, particularly on GMO, because GMO destroys everything. You know, if that gets into the food chain, the whole lot goes. You can't get back out of it again. It's, it's very similar to a situation with the vaccinations of COVID. You know, it's all the same story. Once it's something which is genetically modified gets into your body, it starts working on the cells of your body. It starts changing them. That's what GMOs do to the soil. They start working with the microbes and they start genetically engineering them, changing the species, changing the DNA of the planet itself. So we fought very hard and we had an extremely successful campaign. We got every province in Poland to declare itself a GMO free zone. And then we tell the chairman of each of the provincial boards to write to the prime minister and demand that he changes that into an act of parliament banning the import and planting of GMO. And the prime minister of Poland did it. So in 2006, Poland became GMO free zone. And we couldn't believe, we had to pinch ourselves, you know, to realize that we'd pull this off. <laughs> so that's pretty much a potted life history. It takes a bit of time to tell it because it's a very diverse story. It's, it's very, very interesting. And if I see an overall thread or an underall thread and why it's great that you're joining us in the new Naogora from your story, it's showing that, you know, people power is very important. Doing an action or as with the, uh, you know, the, the natives of Australia not doing an action, is equally powerful. And we, we do have that power to act or not act in the ways that we choose. And we can bring about change or stop, you know, uh, tyrants from ruling our lives simply by making a choice and uh, in on mass, I would say, coming together and, and making that work. You know, and it's That's very right. important. That's right, so true. Very important. That's really right. And, and I think the point there is that we, we know that only really by working together now much more so can we achieve the sort of change which is demanded because we're under intense pressure at this point in time to completely become slaves. I know we're being told, sorry, you're not in control at all anymore. You might've thought you were in the past, you were a little bit, but now we're gonna take it away from you. And what's more, you elected us to do it and we're doing it to care for you, aren't we? Well, you know, we care about your health, which is why we're going to jab you and give you PCR tests and, uh, then jab you again later on and tell you you can't leave your home and tell you you really can't do anything ultimately. You can't talk and you can't, uh, your thinking will be monitored. And if your thinking is about something positive, well, it's very bad news for us. So we won't allow you to think anything positive. So we're moving into that age if you accept the uh, sort of uh, futuristic, uh, the futuristic approach, which says that mankind will be connected up to a computer because his brain's not much use for anything else other than uh, mediocre things. And if you really want to understand and assemble all the facts you will need to live in the, that new age, you will have to have yourself plugged into a computer, care of people like Elon Musk and his colleagues. So yes, the only way around that is to get back to what's specifically human, what's specifically earthy, what's specifically real in life, which will involve many people returning to the land. And I believe, as a necessity, not purely a necessity of eating, but that's obviously the number one, but a necessity of regrounding ourselves in an age where we're being forced into a virtual reality world, where we will be totally controlled if we accept it. No way out. So the only way out, I think, is to reestablish communities on the land where we grow our own food, we re, we re purify our water, we re-establish relationships with each other based on necessity and love. 
And uh, we move forward as human race in the direction we were always supposed to go. You know, and that was interrupted at some point in the last thousands or so years. And another force got in, which has been directing us ever since. And we've allowed it. We've been extremely lazy as a human race. We've said to ourselves, look, we've got this thing called democracy. We can elect people to, to do the dirty work. We don't really want to know anything about that. Let, let them do it. Let's get on with our lives and have fun and earn some money and as much money as possible and make the best of this world while we're still on it. We're not here very long, 70, 80 years. Well, that was a massive, massive, massive mistake, quite obviously. You know, we let people who were never, ever going to actually take much concern <laughs> with us, but were going to make a huge amount of a killing for their dear egos and for the wealthy bank balances and for everything else which they wanted to do at our expense and claiming this was the democratic way forward. So the lessons to be learned historically are huge. And I think they are the lessons of this moment. And the COVID thing is a sort of um, symbol to put in front of us the demons that we allowed to be created which have operated actually in secret societies and things like that for the last thousand years. They've gone under the surface, but we felt it. We felt nervous about something. You know, they may have something's really wrong on a deeper level. Now they're on the surface and we see them and we don't like what we're seeing. Not surprisingly, because we're seeing a reflection partly of our own demons that never came through. We never came through as true spiritual beings that we are. And the longer you repress that, that thing, the more demonic it's bound to become because it turns into its opposite. And this is what we're seeing today, everything turning into its opposite. It's the Nazi symbol, you know, the uh, Nazi symbol, the swastika being turned into a swastika from what was a beautiful Indian peace symbol. This is a classic phenomenon of this, this era we're living in right now, everything being put into its reverse. So we are being given many, many opportunities to look this thing in the face, take it on directly and say, okay, big mistake. Now we're going to really redraw the line, connect up with each other, move forward as light beings in a very practical, pragmatic sense, not just meditators, not at all, activists. We've got to get rid of these people, we've got to yeah. kick them out, whatever means we can. And simultaneously, we're going to have to nurture our new life on the land, in villages, in small towns, probably not in big cities. They're very difficult to manage sustainably anyway. And try and cut ourselves back out of all this virtual world. Action, I, I would agree. It, it's one of the things that's kept me going when things were hard. You know, what inspired me to want to do the new now Agora is so that we can meet people like yourself. Yourself can meet people like other people. You never know who you're going to get a chance to interact with. And you know, we take it from the virtual back to the real, you know, we get to meet someone, you know, I, I haven't talked to Poland before, you know, I'm in Japan, so we're talking from very, you know, diverse parts of the world right now, and yet we're connecting in ways that is allowing me to be inspired with what Julian has been sharing, and, you know, as other people talk to me, I'll be able to make the relationships or to make the connections that maybe is required for his land in, in England, or, or what's also required in Poland with what they're doing. My ancestry is Poland, is Polish, actually. So oh, right. Yeah, yeah. So it's very interesting for me to, uh, you know, be connecting in this way to kind of come full circle in my life in, in many, many ways. And, uh, you know, I'm delighted that Julian is here to join us in our new now Agora. Like, Julian, maybe there's something you'd like to, you know, tell our viewers uh, as to uh, what you'll be doing over the next little bit in the near future, how they can support right. you, uh, what you may be sharing with us in the new now Agora. And, uh, you know, keep in mind, this will be the first of many chats we'll get to have with them. Okay. <laughs> Um, you know, the future is um, rather wobbly, isn't it, at the moment? So if one says what one's going to do, you have to set it in the context of a situation where we're being restricted, highly restricted from what we actually can do. But it doesn't bother me, but I'm so used to being an activist now that I have lost any sense of fear concerning confronting what needs to be done. Actually, I might even mention this because it you know, we are, fear is the, really the key to how they keep the repression on us. And there's no doubt about the fact that every psychologist and psychiatrist and, and insider who knows how to manipulate people knows that the fear weapon is the key to their success. So for us as human beings, we must rather simply work out that we must overcome fear. And it's a beautiful thing. 
to overcome fear. It's a really very beautiful thing. It goes hand in hand with not being afraid of death. You know, they're actually the same thing. They're no different. The overcoming fear, not fearing death is the same thing. So I'm not sure how to answer the question other than to say, we, I'm proceeding along a inner line of working, inner development, which is to overcome fear when it shows itself, if it shows itself. I've got quite a long way with that. Uh, and I'm on the outer level, I'm very determined to still realize I'm 74 years old, but I still feel there's a great deal which I need to do on this planet. And there's a great deal I still need to communicate and share with people. And I want to make it possible for younger people, particularly, who are caught up in this virtual reality world of mobile phones and games and you know, almost every, everything but the reality of making a new society on the ground. And I want to try and introduce younger people into the idea that you can get out there and you can do it. We can do it together. Young and old must work with each other. You know, they must learn from my wisdom. I can learn from their creativity and their energy, which I love, of course, in young people. But it needs to be channeled into, into actuality, which will overcome the dark forces. So we will always be talking about a joining of the spiritual and the practical. You know? The pragmatic and the spiritual will be inseparable in this new era, rather than saying, I'm going to go and do my meditation now, leave me alone, I must be absolutely quiet. And then I'm going to go out and something the opposite. You know, I'm going out in the fields, I'm going to work right here. Well, gradually, I think what will happen is those things will come together. And you'll find it's just as meditative, planting seeds. And it's just as uh, active <laughs> being a meditation because you'll be traveling probably somewhere in the universe when you're meditation. You know, you won't be just sitting there. So these uh, sort of energies will come together. People will recognize that they don't have enemies in life, really. Nations, states will become much more liberal in the sense that they will be able to travel everywhere. People will be able to meet each other from different nationalities. People will be encouraged to do that. They will be encouraged to share their different cultural beautiful things which have been repressed under COVID, as you'll notice, the arts have been stamped on very heavily. So all these beautiful uh, creative elements that make cultures very interesting to each other will return with a vengeance, I suspect. And we will have a great dance. There's some French group who, who suddenly got themselves organized during COVID in Paris and came out and did this dance. I can't remember what it's called exactly now, but they came on to Gare du Nord in Paris and they suddenly started dancing and playing guitars. And it was all about how we are liberating ourselves from COVID. And this is the sort of first step one can take. Get in amongst people, leaflet people, educate people, become very active, become very focused. Know that your life is about that. And that's the key to it. All the rest of it's peripheral. All the rest of it's from nine to five job will have to go, I think. Don't you? I, I, I agree. I, I haven't had enough. <laughs> uh, you know, like when you're doing something you love, like I've been doing with the new Agora, it seems like you're always working and you're never working. So, you know, everything kind of becomes, you know, integrated. You know, life is about making something beautiful and creating. It's not about earning money, although, you know, you want to earn money, let's say. or have You have it. to do it. Yeah. yeah. You have to do it. You know, being abundant is great. Having currency is great. Living a happy life is great. You know, integrating the spiritual with yourself. I, I, I firmly know from what I've seen for myself, we are spiritual, whether we act on it or not. So, you know, regardless. Yes, well said. We yeah. are spiritual beings. Are. That's exactly the point that I was going to make too. We are spiritual beings. It's not a question of really having to try and find the spiritual being in yourself. That's, the, that's actually not the case. We yeah. are that. So yeah. we just give in to it. Give in to it. Give in to it. You know, and that's the great beauty of it. Give in to it. And, and that's why being in nature is so critical. I agree. Because there, you know, you can share, you can feel, you can listen, you can watch, and you can work. And you can gradually, gradually ground yourself again. Because I keep coming back to this idea of grounding. It's a bit like, you know, the American Indian tribes that do this dance where you bang the ground with your feet and you go up in your aspiration to the divine. To the, and then you go bang back to the ground again and then bang. To, you're always working between these two, the gravity and beyond gravity. Gravity, beyond gravity. Gra 
And that is the sort of pulse of life itself, I think. It is. And we're, we're away from it. We're a very long way from it. But having this conversation, uh, which is a nice conversation, is already illuminating, you know, that feeling in ourselves, which is an artistic, creative feeling. It's what yeah. we're about. It, it, you, I, I want to thank you for inspiring me quite a bit in this conversation. You've reminded me of a lot of my own experiences and why I want to do what we're going to do here. You know, bringing people together, new ideas coming, things you never thought you always wanted will show up. You know, things you never knew you never needed will show up and we'll get an opportunity to share together. You know, we'll bring it from the virtual back to the real and we'll get a chance to, uh, you know, help each other grow into a beautiful, happy, healthy sort of life. And, uh, you know, you know, I feel like I've known Julian forever, even though we've never really met. This is our first time chatting. But, uh, it, you know, it seems we're becoming fast friends in this short conversation. So it's why we are doing our new now Agora. So you can join us. You can chat with him. You can chat with us. If you have any questions or suggestions or recommendations from this chat, you can leave it below in the video. I'll leave my contact. I'm sure Julian will share his. We'll be happy to get back to you and expand on what we've brought here to you today. <laughs> Very good. Julian, thank you very so much good. for joining us. We'll leave more below. I'll talk to you all again very, very soon. Be sure to uh, join our newsletter if you haven't, where I'll be uh, updating everyone when we're going to go live. And you'll get an opportunity, perhaps, to have the fun that I've had today in getting to directly interact with Mr. Julian Rose. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Julian. Thank you. Good luck to everybody out there. Oh, my son.